Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today is a bit of a house cleaning, really. Short takes on products I've received from different manufacturers, and which either Claudia or I have put to daily use for months now. First up, two items for Claudia's Leica Q3. Let's start with Oberworth's Louis V Flex, a high-end shoulder bag. 800 bucks worth of a high-end shoulder bag, which I'd intended to test with my Leica M11 VisaFlex 2 attached with an additional Lenser 3, because this is the camera configuration for which the bag was designed. The problem is that the moment Claudia saw it, she claimed it for her like a Q3, and who can really blame her? It's got that signature Oberworth design, quality leather and hardware in a significantly smaller, lighter package, with a more supple kind of pebbled leather than the smooth SL medium bag I tested a few months ago. And I really liked that bag. While the Louis V Flex is deeper than what one would need for a Q3 alone, after pulling out a couple of the dividers and blocks designed for that M11 kit, it became a perfect all-in-one allowing Claudia to carry the Q3 and everything else she might need for a day of shooting on the street, like extra battery, SD card, wallet, phone, a couple of energy bars, even a small bottle of water. She loves it, and I understand why. The one downside, if you ask her, is the same one I identified in the SL Medium bag. When it starts to rain, the combination of unstructured, less than full coverage side flaps beneath the main flap, and the lack of a weather resistant zipper to fully seal them shut against the elements, basically guarantees that whatever is inside will get wet. Call this bag beautiful and ab fab in anything other than inclement weather, but I would urge Oberworth to address this weakness, especially because while the Q3 is IP52 rated, as is the Q2, actually, neither the M nor any lens for it is weather, dust, or freeze resistant. Next, an aftermarket grip for the Q3 from IDS. This is an easy one. Simply put, this is a third-party grip made of what appears to be anodized aluminum and is superior to the factory original grip from Leica itself, as long as you don't care about Qi charging. Unlike the factory grip, the IDS grip has an integrated, full-width, Arca-Swiss compatible bottom sill, yet still allows access to the SD card slot door, the battery compartment, and the lever, which releases the battery. It is robust, beautifully finished, and somehow manages to blend seamlessly with Q3's design vocabulary, even as the grip has its own modest but clear design fillip, which I quite like. Although, to be fair, it must be acknowledged the provision of a USB-C port with power delivery does much to alleviate the lack of card and battery access. It's easy enough to download images or charge the camera through that port. In any event, I'm happy to recommend the IDS grip highly. It is to my way of thinking, as I just said, better than the factory original unless you insist on Qi charging and marginally less expensive to boot in all versions, ranging from 160 bucks for the black or gray aluminum grips to 155 for the African blackwood grip and 150 bucks for the walnut grip. Finally, let's talk about Zhiyun's Mola's G200 bicolor LED monolight. Now, there is a lot to like about this light beginning with bicolor, but more importantly, quite high output for the price and moving on to very quiet cooling, a separate head cooling and control unit, which at the very least is an homage to Aperture's 120 and 300 series COB monolights, which by the way, bracket the G200 in terms of output, again, while being bicolor, very impressive, controls that haven't failed once, and a nicely finished pair of soft boxes with grids and diffusers to go with it. So far, so good. But the one thing I've learned over years of testing new LED monolights in particular is that the most important thing to evaluate after checking output and color accuracy is reliability. Maybe reliability is the most important thing, period, because color accuracy and output across the board have improved tremendously. But what I have continued to see far too often are otherwise attractive lights suffering from any number of physical maladies, from broken switchgear to sudden noises, even sudden failure, just months after use. This is why I've stopped accepting most invitations to review new lights and have standardized on Aperture over the last half decade or so. But Zhiyun is not an unknown name in the business. I know of it specifically for their gimbals, two of which I've owned and have been quite good, so I decided to give their Mollus G200 a go. But there are 
Four issues which prevent it from dislodging Aperture as my favorite lighting company, attractive as the G200 is. 1. The app for it opened with such a long EULA and user license agreement that I grew less comfortable with each passing second as I read it. It actually stopped me cold from agreeing, and that meant I didn't have remote control. 2. This lack of remote control was a pain forcing me to go back to the control unit each time I wanted to change color, temperature, or power. This was inconvenient, but it also meant I had to interact with the panel and switch gear regularly, both of which struck me as anodyne in appearance and function, which is to say, not bad, just not interesting or appealing. 3. The G200 did not work with the standard Bowens S-mount attachments I have, although it did work seamlessly with the pair of rather nice Xeon soft boxes that came with it. I'm using it right now. I've been using it for months. The light output, everything about it is great. But this, the mounting, is an issue for me personally, as I do not like futzing with light modifiers at all, although I recognize their importance and reconcile my antipathy toward futzing by choosing to rely on a single light modifier standard, not two or three. Four. The most unsettling thing I experienced over an extended test period with the G200 is that about two months ago, I mean, I've been using it as the daily driver for months, I'd power up the light and increasingly find that even though the color temperature setting hadn't changed, I set it to 4700 Kelvin, the light itself would power up at what looked like 3200 Kelvin. I mean, it was easy enough to fix either by turning it off and on again or by changing the color temperature manually. But as I said, I found this unsettling. Now, one could argue this is no big deal. The amount of nice, clean, quiet, bicolor light at the price being sufficient to compensate for the occasional glitch. But I don't think so, at least not for myself. I want each purchase I make to reduce futzing and anxiety, not increase them. So what's the bottom line? I'd direct you to other reviews of the light to see what others' long-term experience have been. For now, I remain less than sanguine about the G200 in spite of how much it has going for it. Then again, if any of you have bought it and spent time with it, I'd love to know what you think in the comments section below. So that's it for this edition of Quick Takes. And frankly, given everything that comes across the transom, three out of four ain't half bad. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comments section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video called Via Zoom at 3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost to you affiliate links down below, sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially joining us on Patreon links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.